there's lots of scary stuff in the Bible. You can begin at the end, the book of Revelation, where there's all kinds of scary things. Locusts with the face of a human, teeth of a lion, tail of a scorpion, and hair of a woman. There's a beast with seven heads and ten horns, having the feet of a bear, the mouth of a lion, and the body of a leopard. Not to mention a red dragon with seven heads and ten horns like the beast, but none of the other stuff because, you know, it's a dragon. But you don't have to wait until the very end of the Bible to find monsters like this. There's Leviathan, a sea monster described in Job, whose skin is covered in a double coat of mail, its back with interlocking shields, and who sneezes light, exhales smoke, and spits torches of fire from its mouth. Some people have tried to say that this is just a poetic description of a crocodile, but besides the fact that crocodiles don't live in the Mediterranean Sea, and while a crocodile is dangerous enough, a fire-breathing crocodile is freaky. And have you read the little book of Daniel? There's four monsters in it. One is a lion with eagle's wings, which transforms into a human thing and has its wings plucked off. One is a bear-like creature who is told to gorge itself on flesh. One looks like a leopard with four wings and four heads. And one has iron teeth and ten horns which it uses to destroy the whole earth. There's lots of disturbing stuff in the Bible. But today I want to call to your attention one particular story which is pretty disturbing. Maybe not spooky in the Halloween sense, but, well... You'll see. It's found in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 26 through 29. Now, as the king of Israel was walking on the city wall, a woman cried out to him, Help, my lord king. He said, No, let the Lord help you. How can I help you? From the threshing floor, from the wine press. But then the king asked her, What is your complaint? And she answered, This woman said to me, Give up your son, and we will eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we cooked my son and ate him. The next day I said to her, Give up your son, and we will eat him. But she has hidden her son. What the heck? I bet you've never heard that story before. I mean, even if you read it, isn't it one of those stories you just try to forget? I mean, what the heck? Like, we had a deal. Yesterday we ate my son, and today we're supposed to eat yours. A deal is a deal. I mean, she's not upset by the child cannibalism. She's upset because the woman reneged on her deal, and now she has nothing to eat. And presumably no more kids of her own to eat. Or maybe they're just hiding after seeing what happened to little Johnny. And you know it was little Johnny, because if it had been big Johnny or even normal-sized Johnny, they'd be eating on him for more than a day. You know, they'd have a little Johnny leftovers. And, and you know, the king is, is going to be like, what the heck are you talking about? Are you not stop eating your kids? But no, that's not what the king does. You know what he does? Check it out. When the king heard the words of the woman, he tore his clothes. Now, since he was walking on the city wall, the people could see that he had sackcloth on his body underneath. And he said, So may God do to me and more if the head of Elisha, son of Shaphath, stays on his shoulders today. What? This woman is yelling to him in broad daylight about eating her son and wanting to eat another boy and the king wants to kill the prophet Elisha? What's Elisha got to do with anything? Obviously, we've got to back it up a bit. Earlier in chapter 6, we learn that the king of Aram was at war with the king of Israel. And one day he calls his officers together and tells them to make camp at such and such a place. That's what he says, camp such and such. Obviously, by the time this was written down, nobody remembered where it was. But apparently it's a place that he expects the, the army of the king of Israel to be. So the king of Aram is planning a surprise attack. But the man of God, 
That's what Elisha is called, the man of God, not a man of God, the man of God. Anyway, Elisha warns the king of Israel not to go by this such and such place because the Arameans are going there to lay in wait. So the king sends word to his troops in the area, warning them of the trap. In fact, he sends word, according to the text, more than once or twice. The Text is a little light on details, you know? But anyway, when the, the king of Aram sees that the Israelites aren't falling into his trap because they've been warned, he suspects a rat in his ranks. He's, it says that he was greatly perturbed because of this. And so he calls all his officers together. Which one of you sides with the king of Israel? Who's the leak? And they say, it's not any of us. It's Elisha, the prophet of Israel, who tells the king of Israel, even the things you speak by yourself in your bedroom. Now, how they know this, the text doesn't say because, you know, details. But the king of Aram totally buys it. I mean, it sounds like a flimsy cover-up, but I guess it has the ring of truth to it because the king of Aram says, find out where this Elisha guy is staying so that I can capture him. And they say, He's in Dothan. So he sends horses and chariots and a great army to Dothan. And during the night, they surround the city. In the morning, when everyone wakes up and sees the Aramean army surrounding them, they're greatly alarmed, greatly perturbed even. And Elisha's servant says, Alas, master, what shall we do? And Elisha says, Ah, eh, no worries. There are more of us than there are of them. And then he prays that God will open the eyes of his servant, which he does. And the servant sees that in the mountains surrounding Dothan, there are horses and chariots of fire. But when the Arameans attack, Elisha doesn't call these chariots of fire down. He prays that the Lord will strike them all blind, which he does. And Elisha goes to them and says, Guys, guys, look, you're in the wrong place, and I'm not the guy you want. Follow me, and I'll take you to the guy you really want. So Elisha leads this army of blind Arameans all the way to Samaria, which is the capital of Israel, where the king of Israel is. And when he gets there, he prays again, and the Lord opens their eyes, and they see that they are in Samaria, surrounded by Israelites. And the king of Israel asks Elisha, Father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? I mean, you can just hear his excitement. Oh, goody, goody, goody. Can I kill them? Can I, can I, can I, can I? And Elisha says to him, kill them? What do you do to capture them? Not a thing, that's what. You know what you're going to do? Feed them. Give them plenty of food and water and send them back to their master. So the king of Israel prepares a great feast for the Arameans, and after they had ate and drank, he sends them on their way. And verse 23 says, And the Arameans no longer came raiding into the land of Israel. Cool. No longer until verse 24. Sometime later, King Ben-Hadad of Aram mustered his entire army. He marched against Samaria and laid siege to it. And the siege lasted so long that there wasn't anything to eat. A donkey's head cost 80 shekels of silver, which apparently is a lot for a donkey's head. It doesn't have a lot of meat and doesn't taste anything like chicken. And a quarter of a cab, whatever that is, a quarter of a cab of dove's dung went for five shekels. So, yeah, little Johnny is looking pretty good right about now. And that's why the king of Israel is so upset with Elisha. If he had just let him kill all the Arameans when he had them in his grasp, Ben-Hadad wouldn't have had an army lay siege to Samaria, and they wouldn't be eating overpriced donkey heads and bird poop and preschoolers. And that's why the king of Israel wanted Elisha dead. But when he sent an assassin to do the deed, Elisha simply said to his attendant, uh, Hey, the, the murderer sent a murderer. Don't let him in. <laughs> and that's all it took, because apparently we're not dealing with a ninja assassin here and a a little chair propped up against the doorknob is all it took to stump him. And when the king comes along, Elisha tells him, 
through the door, apparently, that by this time tomorrow a measure of choice meal will be sold for only a shekel. In other words, the famine will be over. And the way it happens is that during the night, the Lord makes the Aramean army hear horses and chariots all around them. And so they take off running. And then the Israelites go into the abandoned camp and they find all kinds of food. And this is the way it goes for the rest of Kings. Elisha, the man of God, does all sorts of miraculous things. And the various kings always do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Elisha dies by chapter 13, and it all goes downhill for the rest of the book until Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon shows up in chapter 25, burns Jerusalem, the temple, the king's palace, kills the king's sons in front of him before putting the king's eyes out and exiling him and the leading men of Jerusalem to Babylon. So what you need to understand about the book of Kings is that it doesn't like kings. It much prefers prophets. Same with the book of Samuel, which is named after a prophet after all. The two books are written and edited by the same hand as part of a continuous narrative that actually starts in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is Moses' farewell speech to the Israelites before he dies and Joshua leads them into the promised land. And in it, Moses warns them about having a king. Moses who's a prophet, but not a king, tells them that if they insist on having a king, God will let them, but they must make sure that the king doesn't get too many horses or marry too many wives or acquire too much gold and silver or think he's better than the people that he rules, or else they'll become his slaves and it'll be worse than when they were in Egypt and eventually the nation will be destroyed and they'll be exiled. Pretty much describing exactly what happened, almost as if Moses' warning was written after everything had already happened. And then in Samuel, once again, named after a prophet, when the people begin clamoring for a king so they can be like all the other nations, Samuel, of course, resists. But in 1 Samuel chapter 8, the Lord tells him to let them have their king, for they have not rejected you, they have rejected me from being king over them. And Samuel tells them what will happen if they get a king. He'll raise a private army answerable to him and not the 12 tribes of Israel. He'll take their sons and make them serve in his army and take their daughters into his harem. He'll take the best of their fields and their vineyards, the best of their sheep and donkeys and cattle. And he'll take their slaves and make them his slaves. And after that, he'll take them and make them his slaves. And then they will cry out to the Lord like they did when they were slaves in Egypt. But the Lord will not listen to them this time pretty much describing exactly what happens in the rest of the books of Samuel and Kings, almost as if Samuel's warning was written after everything had already happened. So when you read Samuel and Kings, even the parts about King David, remember that the books of Samuel and Kings don't like kings. And even the best of kings, like David, a man after God's own heart, don't keep their hearts true and end up, at best, doddering old fools, and at worst, men who do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. But prophets, starting with Moses, and then Samuel, Elijah, Elisha, Jeremiah, Isaiah, all the big names, these men speak for God and do acts befitting one who speaks for God. So, I offer that to you as an interpretive tool in reading Deuteronomy, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings. But there's more at stake here than just a, a historical interest in the monarchy or of Israel or an interpretive device to use in understanding these books of the Old Testament. Think of the struggle between kings and prophets this way. The monarchy represents a top-down, hierarchical, rigid form of rules-based religion. When a king issues a command, your only choice 
is to obey the king. There's no discussion, no appeal to circumstance or allowance for special conditions. You do what the king says, even if what the king says is stupid or makes no sense or is unjust and unfair. The king's command is law. He and only he has sole discretion as to making the rule, interpreting the rule, applying the rule, enforcing the rule, and deciding whether a rule is outdated and needed, needs updating to a different time and context. A king is an autocrat, and the role of a subject is to obey, period. Now, that's okay when you're new to religion, when you're new to faith. By definition, when you're new, you don't know much of anything and, and you need someone who can give you clear, definite direction. Here, read this first, then read this. Do this first and after you've got that down, do this next. But that's all that a rules-based religion can do. It can tell you what to do and what not to do in a lot of situations, and as long as those circumstances are all that you encounter, well, then you're good. But life isn't that simple. Faith isn't that simple. There aren't enough rules that can be created that will cover every situation. And even if there were, nobody could remember them all. I mean, think about it. The Israelites started with 10 commandments, 10. And they're easy to remember, for the most part. Pop quiz. Stop the video and write down the Ten Commandments from memory. Don't even worry about getting them in order. Just see if you can get all ten. Did you get all ten? Okay. So, the Israelites started with ten that are fairly easy to remember. But before long, those 10 grew to over 600. And you needed specialists to write them down and remember them and interpret them. And, and even the specialists disagreed with each other. And everyone else just had to do what the specialists said, even if the specialists disagreed. That or quit. Just stop trying because it was impossible. But that's it. Those are the two paths for a regular person. Just follow blindly what the specialist said or quit. And that's not much of a faith. To become better and better at blindly following rules or quitting altogether. Because, see, rules-based religion doesn't teach you to grow, to Think. In fact, the last thing rules-based religion wants you to do is to think for yourself. Thinking for yourself can only get you in trouble. That's what rules-based religion believes. In rules-based religion, thinking leads to questioning, and questioning leads to resisting, and resisting leads to non-compliance, and non-compliance leads to rebellion, and rebellion leads you to hell. And that's why the first thing that autocrats do when they take power is to get rid of the intelligentsia, the learned, the experts, anyone who might think for themselves and question the edicts of the autocrat. But the spirit of the prophet is about thinking for yourself. It's about always doing the right thing in every situation, not because you know the rules, but because you have learned what is good and right and just and know how to apply that knowledge in new and oftentimes unforeseen circumstances. See, the prophets didn't pay attention to rules. They paid attention to the Spirit of God. And and that drives rule-based religion nuts because rule-based religion is about control. And you can't control the spirit. It's like Jesus said to Nicodemus, the spirit is like the wind. It blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. And so is everyone who is born of the spirit. 
And part of the reason for the conflict between kings and prophets is that the kings couldn't control the prophets. And like I said, that drove them nuts. And the prophets didn't even try to control the kings. They simply reported what they had heard from the Lord and let the kings decide for themselves whether to listen or not to their woe or to their weal. The spirit of prophecy is exemplified in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? You know what's good. Do it. You know what's just. So do it. Laws and rules aren't always just. Do justice. Laws and rules aren't always kind. Love kindness. Do it. Laws and rules aren't always just. Do justice. Laws and rules aren't always kind. Love kindness. Rules can't cover every situation, but in every situation, you can seek to be kind and to do what's just, even if it's not always black and white, which it often isn't, which is why you have to remain humble and just do your best. The best teachers I ever had weren't the ones who just taught me stuff. Anybody can teach you stuff. The best teachers, while they were teaching me stuff, were also teaching me how to think. A mediocre piano teacher will teach you how to play songs on the piano, but the best teacher will use songs to teach you music so that eventually you can move beyond just playing songs and learn to interpret songs and to create music. And I try to do something similar in these messages. I'm not just trying to teach you what the text of the day means. I'm also trying to show you principles and methods for how to read scripture for yourself. So like today, I, I want you to understand this tension between kings and prophets so that when you read Deuteronomy and Samuel and Kings, you'll have something to hang your hat on so that you'll not only understand what is going on, but why. I want you to be able to understand not only this very, very strange and disturbing passage, but others like it. Like when some boys make fun of Elisha's bald head and a she-bear comes out of the woods and mauls them. But here's the bottom line. A king wants nothing more than for people to be good subjects of the kingdom and do what the king says. The prophets wanted people to be the people of God and do what pleased God without having to be told every step of the way, to do it because it was who they were created to be. To put it another way, rules-based religion wants you to be a better practitioner of the religion called Christianity. The prophets want you to be a better human because that's what God created you to be. When Jesus came, the Jewish leadership was looking for a king to come, a king in the mold of David. The gospel writers make it clear that Jesus was indeed a king, but though he was of the line of David, he wasn't a king in the mold of David. He was a king in the mold of a prophet, which was the last thing the Jewish leaders wanted. But the Jewish people, <laughs> they'd had their fill of kings. They saw in Jesus the spirit of a prophet, and they welcomed him. And if you will welcome him too, he won't try to control your life, but he'll free you to live the life God has always wanted for you. Father, you have breathed the breath of life in us, giving us your spirit so that we might have a life of freedom in Christ. Continue the work of transformation in us 
so that we can move beyond doing good because we've been commanded to do it to doing good because we know it's good and right because we love kindness and we walk humbly in step with you. In Jesus' name, amen.